We never should have let him stay on board. He'll eat our food, drink our water, and double-cross us first chance he gets. What are you afraid of? He's one against seven. It was eight yesterday. Or have you forgotten? Welcome to the premiere episode of Modern Technology Watches. Ooh! Yeah, I am uh, Rob Vincent. I'm Gila Drazen. And we are a married couple who are going to be watching some films together and discussing them. And what I've done here is the movie we're going to be watching today is one that I have not told you about. I'm going to reveal to you what we're going to be watching, then we'll stop the recording, uh, watch the movie, and come back. Okay, great. I'm very excited. Okay. In fact... I should just uh, go grab it off the DVD shelf, which is not too far from here. Okay, so I'm going to take this moment to say that we have, we get along great. We've been married for almost a year, and we have rather dissimilar tastes, I think one could say. We appreciate the things that we both like, but we have very divergent tastes in what we enjoy. Yeah, we, we have both uh, come from very different places, and... So uh, we grew up with different things, and part of the joy of this whole relationship has been introducing one another to those things. Yes. Okay, so what do we got? So what we got is the film Lifeboat, the 1944 Alfred Hitchcock film Lifeboat. By John Steinbeck. By John Steinbeck. Starring Tallulah Bankhead, some other folks. Hume Cronin. Hume Cronin is in it. Yes, young Hume Cronin. All right. Nominated for three Academy Awards, Alfred Hitchcock's gripping World War II drama is a remarkable story of human survival. Is that just off the top of your head? I yeah, yeah. You didn't know the movie. Either. I don't, really. I'm just guessing here. Just, just, uh, spitballing. After their ship is sunk in the Atlantic by Germans, eight people are stranded in a lifeboat. Their problems are further compounded when they pick up a ninth passenger, the Nazi captain from the U-boat that torpedoed them. With powerful suspense and emotion, this legendary classic reveals the strengths and frailties of individuals under extraordinary duress. Yeah, and uh, this is something that actually came up in conversation when your mom was in town. That is true. And uh, I thought it, I, I got the bug in my ear then, because we have a, a pretty sizable video collection between uh, the two of that's us. That's a really good way to put it, yeah. And there's a lot on that shelf that one or the other of us has not yet seen, so um, I think this counts as uh, my turn. <laughs> and uh, next week uh, you'll you'll get to pick out something, or maybe maybe we'll find some way to randomize it down the line. But well, I mean, we've randomized before. You know, we've got all of your fun dice. We do, yeah. We have occasionally chosen a movie on uh, movie night by uh, rolling some old Dungeons and Dragons dice that uh, that I've got to uh, narrow down shelves on the uh, you know which shelf on the shelving unit and which uh, subsection of the shelf and so on until we happen upon something. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, I think we will take this time to pause the recording, um, go get some movie snacks, and uh, sit down and watch this, and then we'll come back and uh, and we'll talk about it. Excellent, sounds like a plan. Are we back? I think we're back. We're back. We're back. And and we've just seen Lifeboat. We have just seen Lifeboat. Now, you were seeing it for the first time. I was. I was seeing it for the first time in a long time. We should describe the basics of this movie yes. for listeners who are not familiar and people who listen to movie podcasts without themselves seeing the movie. Um, if you have access to see this, you should probably watch it because we are going to be spoilering the hell out of it. Right. Okay. So let me see if I can describe this. Mm -hmm. There's a boat. Yes. Right? Right. And it's a lifeboat, right? It's a, it's a lifeboat. So there's a boat. Yes. And there's people living on it, right? It's a lifeboat. Lifeboat. Yeah, oh. there you go. That's the movie. Oh, well, that's, I think you, I think that's your, uh, that, that's your, uh, I think you've summed it up pretty well. Thank that's, you and good night. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for listening. Uh, uh, we hope you the, enjoyed like Modern review, Technology subscribe. Watches uh, and, you know. No, uh, okay. So the, <laughs> the idea of lifeboat, <laughs> it, it was, it was an Alfred Hitchcock film. Yes. Um, he was a filmmaker of some uh, renown. Um, at the... At the time, this was not really all that well received. Um, this came out in 1944 during the war. Um, there was a little ad for war bonds on the screen that said the end. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Said, they, the end, buy your war bonds here. And then, I was looking for a place in our apartment to buy war bonds, Rob, and I can't find one. Well, I, I, I think we haven't put that bit in yet. But, okay, uh, you okay. know, once we do some remodeling, we'll sure. put in the booth for the war bonds and okay. uh, maybe right. a popcorn machine. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, this film uh, has kind of a, a unique place in history. It's one of those movies made about the war during the war. Mm-hmm. Um, it was written by John Steinbeck, who uh, wrote a lot of the stuff that you probably had to read in school if you went to school in the United States. Um, I mean, that was honestly one of the first things that I noticed. And it's the first thing that I wrote down. It was like, does stuff like this happen anymore? Because it was a Hitchcock film of a mm-hmm. Steinbeck story starring Tallulah Bankhead. Mm-hmm. Who and herself was a pretty big deal at the time. Absolutely. Like the Although list, she hadn't made a movie for a while before this. The list of the cast was Tallulah Bankhead and a bunch of other people. Yeah, as as you did. Um, and I'm wondering if that's kind of a thing that happens anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yes, but not in the same way, necessarily. If it was like, you know, sort of when uh, the Da Vinci Code happened, right? And it was the Da Vinci Code starring Tom Hanks. And it was a big deal. Mm-hmm. But do you get that kind of like trifecta of director, material, and actor in the same way today? That's interesting. Do people get that psyched about it? Yeah, because uh, Da Vinci Code, uh, of course, was an adaptation of a book that was already a big deal. Right. It was already popular. Um, this was not a book. Uh, Steinbeck wrote it for the screen mm-hmm. um, at the behest of uh, Hitchcock. He he also asked uh, Ernest Hemway, Hemingway and uh, some other people who were you know who are uh, known writers of the past now, but at the time they were writers of the then. Um, and uh, but he en- he ended up getting Steinbeck to write it. I've got the Wikipedia article uh, open here, and we're going to be reading from that while we do our recap. Uh, Wikipedia is, of course, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0, so uh, it's perfectly <laughs> compatible with what we do here. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it, it had uh, what's what's seen as a, a, a well-known cast uh, now, but at the time, I don't know how well-known they were. They were kind of all day players, apart from Tallulah, well, I think. So there's Tallulah Bankhead and Hume Cronin mm-hmm. and... Hume Cronin as uh, Stanley Sparks Garrett. Um, I'll just I'll just read the uh, I'll just read the cast list here. Tallulah Bankhead headlines. Uh, she was Constance Porter. Um, William Bendix was Gus Smith. Uh, Walter Slezak as Captain as uh, Capitan Willie. Uh, Mary Anderson as Alice McKenzie. John Hodiak as John Kovac. Henry Hull as uh, Ritt. Charles Rittenhouse. Uh, Heather Angel as Mrs. Higley. Hume Cronin as Stanley Sparks Garrett. And Canada Lee as Joe Spencer. Of course. Mm-hmm. Also known as George. Also known as George. Also known as charcoal. Yeah, that's not okay. Um, yes, for for those uh, for those not playing along, uh, that was the African American character. Um, and in 1944, you could you could say that sort of thing in a film. Um, you could probably say it in real life. So, okay, here's part of. For those of you who don't know, I'm Jewish. Wait, you're Jewish? I know. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. I'm Jewish. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So um, this was a World War II movie that I hadn't seen. Mm -hmm. Partially because, you know, there's no Jews in it and really only one Nazi. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Honey, I don't want to disappoint you at all, but it didn't really set my world on fire. So to speak. So to speak. Okay, well, let's just uh, describe the plot really uh, in, in broad strokes is there are these uh, people on an American uh, boat that gets sunk by a German uh, U-boat. Um, they're, they're out in the water somewhere. They get sunk by the Germans. Um, and this scrappy band of survivors of the boat that went down uh, end up on a single lifeboat, um, plus a German who, spoiler alert, turns out to be the captain of the U-boat that sunk them because... Um, it also got uh, got sunk. So, uh, yeah, the the um, the idea here of the the people that had to you know scrape together what they had and get along and there are all sorts of uh, bickering and stuff. You know, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of a it's it's kind of a standard plot as these things go. I mean, you're, they're on a boat. They're on a boat. And they're trying to survive, and they don't mm-hmm. know which way they're going, and the compass is broken. And, and there's a war on. And there's a war on. And also, you know, the general kind of hijinks that ensue when a random group of people 
is enclosed in a small space. Mm -hmm. A random group of people, all different social classes. So it's the breakfast club on a boat. It's the breakfast club on a boat. Oh, my God, you're right. (laughs) Um, And uh, (laughs) Dear Hitler. Dear Hitler. (laughs) (laughs) We we accept that every one of us... (laughs) Every one of us is a Nazi and a reporter and a guy with one leg. And <laughs> You see us as you want to see us, as the enemy. Any questions? <laughs> Sincerely yours, the Lifeboat Club. <laughs> Q, don't you forget about me in German. Um... Hey, 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 hey. And that's all you see at the end is Tallulah just with her fist up in the air. There we go. Yeah. Um, so that was also something that I noticed. Did Tallulah ever play not Tallulah? No, she was one of the, she was one of those actors like uh, like your your Arnold Schwarzeneggers or Jack Nicholsons or 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 you know Jennifer Lawrence's of today, where they basically always play the same character, um, and it's basically who they who they wear, their public face. Um, you know, she, she's got that husky, uh, three packs a day voice and she calls everyone darling, darling. And like, she, she's, uh, you know, very, uh, very chiseled and, uh, looks ready to either smooch you or bite your head off at any moment. Or both. Or both. Or and, both. you know, very concerned about her stuff. hmm Yeah. She's, she's the classy war reporter who, uh, was, uh, writing and filming on the ship, and uh, at the beginning, she's all proud of the uh, the footage she took of the um, of the battle, and then she loses her camera first thing. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's one of those, and then she she ends up with the with you know all these scruffy people around her doing things, and um, and then she's like, gotta get with one of the guys because yeah. you know. <sighs> Let's get to that. Uh, let's let's go through the plot really quick. Sure. If uh, if you'd like to do that. But, Absolutely. And uh, feel free to jump in here with, we both took notes during the movie. We did. Um, I, we, I... Took a, we took a certain amount of chicken scratchy notes. <laughs> um, I, I can probably still read some of mine. I can definitely read some of mine, but I think I stopped after a while. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's one of those things where, like, at the beginning, they're they're setting things up and everything's happening and things are going on, and then after that, it's just okay. What's what's changed in the situation? Well, here's one of my There's ongoing to write notes about ongoing questions. Yes, what, they were smoking through the entire movie. Oh yes, well, was the boat not made out of wood? <laughs> like, I would have been concerned they, about fire. They they probably they could probably ash into the ocean. Um, right, but like, wh- did they have lighters? They they had lighters. Everyone had a lighter. It was 1944. You you got you got lighters just issued to you. Yeah, but I mean, did they not get destroyed? Like I, matches things. Ugh, I, I mean, I, j- the the kits that they used to give soldiers like came with cigarettes and matches, along with like rations and whatnot. Um, okay, so uh, lifeboat starts. Uh, and here's the plot section from the Wikipedia article for lifeboat 1944 film. Um, Several British and American civilian service members and merchant mariners are stuck in a lifeboat in the North Atlantic after their ship and a U-boat sink each other in combat. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, Tallulah is the first one on the boat. Um, she looks pristine. She's, uh, she's, in a, she's in a mink coat. She's all chiseled. And uh, it later turns out that she was uh, in the lifeboat because she was filming what was going on from that lifeboat. And she had all her stuff. And she's she wearing her, her mink coat. Yeah. She's, you know perfectly made up and uh, hair, not a hair out of place in that, you know, lacquered 1940s sort of way. Of course. And you see what's going, you see things in the water, basically through her lens at the beginning. Yeah. Stuff floating by, uh, bodies, uh, random, uh, random, like a deck of cards, uh, random stuff. Baby bottle. Baby bottle. Because of course, um, one thing, one thing I had in my notes that, uh, you, that you noticed as well is, uh, in the opening credits of the film, which, uh, roll over this, the. Uh, the makeup artist was Guy Pierce. Yes, a famous uh, American actor Guy Pierce. Well, I think isn't Memento he? He's or, not English. He's not or, American. Or, he's Australian. Is, is he Australian? Yeah, you're you're right. Um, he's definitely well, from somewhere in the Commonwealth. But but, but he's, he's played Americans. He has definitely played Americans. And and uh, something like sixty years before any of that, he was doing uh, Hume Cronin's makeup on. Uh, it might have been a different Guy Pierce. Can we not suspend our disbelief? This is not a place for suspending disbelief. This is a film podcast. Excuse me. I just watched a movie where they were stuck on a boat for I don't know how long, and no one had more than a five o'clock shadow. This is true. I'm just saying. I, I don't think they, they perfected growing beards yet in the 40s. Okay. Is that how that worked? That's totally how that works. Okay. Then how do you explain Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> Good point. Um, I think his was on hooks. They just hooked over his ears. Okay. 
He, he put it on a. I learned so much from you. Next to his bed. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, and uh, another thing from my notes is when when she pulls on the first uh, the first she, the first one she pulls on is uh, what's his name the scruffy dude. Uh, Kovac. Kovac, and. Uh, you know, they, they start talking, and uh, the first thing she does when this guy is gasping for air after uh, crawling onto a lifeboat um, is stick a cigarette in his mouth and light it for him because, you know... 1944. 1944. Yes, you're, you're, you're exhausted. You're in medical danger. Uh, you, you almost just died. Here, have a, have a cancer stick. Um, Did they call that them then? <laughs> I don't know. I, think, I, I don't think they... Uh, I, I think they probably called them, like, a vitamin at that point yeah, in history. Yeah, it was definitely were, like a, a health it, supplement. Yes, yeah, so it was vitamin SIG. <laughs> and uh, she uh, she pulls him aboard. She pulls uh, the stock African American character aboard, who himself is dragging along a grieving mother, um, a grieving English mother who has a baby that's not doing at all well because uh, um, he or she is in fact dead. Um, did we know? Th- did she know the baby was dead when they got on the boat? I don't know if uh, they knew when 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 they got on the boat, but uh, they definitely knew soon. And there was that whole like. She's going on about her baby, and the the other characters are just looking at each other meaningfully and shaking their heads no. And yeah, because there was only so much you could uh, you could do to uh, say like, I mean, it's film, it's classy. You can't just go say, oh, there's the dead baby now. You're, uh, uh, you know, they they. I don't know. Right. Okay, so on the boat we have plucky reporter Connie Porter. Plucky reporter Connie. Porter. <laughs> plucky plucky. Reporter Connie Porter. Plucky reporter Connie Porter. Uh, Gus Smith, who is uh, one of the, um, I think he was a crewman. Yeah. Um, a guy who's always going on about uh, how good a dancer he is, and he's got a hurt leg. Yes. Um, he, lo- he, he loves dancing. He loves dancing. And he loves his girlfriend. He loves his girlfriend, he's Rosie. He's from New York. He's from New York. Um, <laughs> there is... Uh, Alice McKenzie, who's uh, sort of... Uh, a, a medical professional. A, a, yeah, a medical professional, a nurse. Um, and, uh, you know, she's the sort of plain woman next to Tallulah. Well, because, who wouldn't be? Yeah, everyone's a plain woman next to Tallulah. Um, Even Hume Cronin was a yeah. plain woman next to Tallulah. <laughs> and uh, Hume Cronin was uh, playing Sparks Garrett, who was... Uh, was he the navigator or the radio operator or something to that effect? Uh, something like that. He was something on the boat and, and he... Yes. Yeah. Played by Hume Cronin, who who I mostly knew from my childhood as uh, the guy in one of the old guys in Cocoon, and I mostly know him as and, old Mister Jessica Tandy. So, yeah. yeah, and but but like seeing him young, like he was in the eighties, he was famous for being the old guy in a lot of movies. Um, but seeing him young, he already looked old. Yeah, just the same exact face. It's the same exact old face. Like <laughs> I, w- I want to see a picture of Hume Cronin as a baby because I bet he was an old looking baby. I'm sure he was. He, he was he was born and uh, the doctor said congratulations it's a haggard middle aged man. <laughs> but, um, you have uh, John Kovac who is the uh, tattooed sailor who goes around bare chested for a great uh, portion of the film. Now, when you first saw one of his tattoos, mm-hmm. there's a later point where Tallulah is giving him a hard time about all his tattoos and they're mm-hmm. all she's just she's assuming they're all women. Yes. However, you and I got hysterical because mm-hmm. the biggest tattoo in the middle of his chest mm-hmm. is a heart yes. with the initials BM in the middle of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which was an ode to, uh, he, he never explains who it's about, uh, but you know, we can, we can accept in our head canon that he got a tattoo as an ode to his favorite bowel, bowel movement. I just think he was saluting his colon health. Really? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, that's important if you're a sailor, you got to stay regular on, Absolutely. The, on the high seas. Absolutely. Um, yes, that's, uh, that's John Kovac, as played by John Hodiak. Um, you have, uh, Ritt, um, the nickname of Charles Rittenhouse Jr., who is played by Henry Hull. He's, he's this, uh, guy who owns factories and, uh, the, the, basically a, a classy sort of rich dude. Um. Why was he on the boat? That's the part I didn't understand. Yeah, he had apparently, he owned shipyards. Um, they say at one point he was going to Spain, but not for the war office or anything, just going for himself. Um, because he was apparently rich enough to not be um, expected to serve in any capacity. He was also kind of an older guy, but... I mean, not that much older, though. That's true. Definitely, I don't know, there's a lot of really interesting coding, I thought. And I also recognize that it's hard to take myself out of the 75 years since this movie came out Mm -hmm. to say, oh, well, 
because he's the one who sat down and said, okay, I'm in charge and I'm just assigning everybody else the work to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's very, uh, yeah. He's very obviously like an upper management guy rather than a get your hands dirty laborer. And also he and intrepid reporter Connie Porter knew each other. That's I'm just going to call her that now mm-hmm. from now on. He and intrepid reporter Connie Porter knew each other in some way, but they felt like, like old buddies. Yeah. You know, like, like old high society pals. Yeah, like very palsy and not mm. like there had been any kind. There was no like inkling of anything romantic. No. About them. No. I mean, I, I think Tallulah was playing uh, younger than him, but also like they, they, these characters had all conceivably known each other on the boat for however long they were all on this, on this ship together before it got sunk. Um, you know, they all, they all had, uh, nicknames for each other and things like that, or for the most part you had, uh, they brought on, uh, Joe Spencer, who was the, uh, black gentleman played by Canada Lee. You who had, they called so many different things. Yeah. They, who they called things that, uh, you would not, you would not say today in person or in film, unless you were the villain. I just meant they called him Joe and they called him George. Oh yes, there there was that too. That was the, really that I was think what it, I meant. It, it was written house that kept calling him George, and I think that was that was sort of a uh, he's you know he's too uh, hoity-toity to learn the uh, lowly dude's name type of type of deal. Wasn't that actually his name though? His his name was Joe. The character's name was Joe. His son's name was George. His son's name was George. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure what that signifies. Me neither. Um, he he also he brought on. Uh, uh, Mrs. Higley, I think, is that character played by Heather Angel, um, who was the grieving mother. And the interesting thing about her was that she was British, but she had been shell shocked in the Blitz, and they mm-hmm. sent her back to America. Yeah, they were sending her back to America to, to get to, her head on right. To get her head on right, and also her husband was already there, I think. Or she was, yeah. And she was bringing the baby to go be with him. Um, and but, then uh, the baby died. And the baby died in the in the attack, and she was cradling the baby for a while before they uh, kind of waited till she fell asleep and gave it sort of a, a service. Um, no one remembered the Lord is my shepherd. No one remembered all the words of Psalm twenty three. Mm-hmm. And this is in my notes. Of course, the black guy knows the psalm. Yeah, yeah, that was that was very much a uh, you know stock uh, black character thing. No and question. I, I think I think you could conceivably. I mean, if you try and be detached about it, you could conceivably say this film was fair for its time uh, regarding uh, racial relations. Um, but uh, at the same time, it did not it does not keep well. The things that he like the, that the character of color did to advance the plot mm-hmm. included knowing all the words to Psalm 23 when it was time to bury the baby at sea. Yes. And playing the flute playing to the keep flute. everyone's spirits yeah. up. So he was the entertainer, yeah. which, you know, oof. And, and he was also in charge of the commissary. He was also in charge of the commissary. And later he's also, his pickpocketing skills come into play. So, you know, he's, he's the, he's the, uh, he's the cook. He's the thief. Um, he's his wife and her lover. He's his wife and her lover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Sorry. That was good. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so the, the, uh, <laughs> and, and he's, and he's the, uh, soulful, uh, guy reciting prayers and, yeah. So so yeah, it, it's it's very much the black part I think in 1944. Absolutely. And uh like like they say when uh, Whoopi Goldberg shows the old Tom and Jerry cartoons, you know, it was wrong then and it's wrong now. Um I mean, recognizing that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Yeah, no, it could it could have been much worse, it, but it, <laughs> apparently that was a sticking point according to uh Wikipedia when it goes into the production section. That was a sticking point that made John Steinbeck who wrote the film very much not like how it came out and tried to uh distance himself from it, tried to get his name taken off of it without success. Um but uh he one of the things he said was that he wrote um I'll see if I can find the quote here. Uh Yeah, Steinbeck uh, received fifty thousand dollars for the rights to his story. That's uh, seven hundred sixty-seven grand today. Wow. Um, Steinbeck was unhappy with the film because it presented what he considered to be quote slurs against organized labor, and also quote a stock comedy Negro. Um, that's a direct quote. Uh, when his story had quote a Negro of dignity, purpose, and personality. 
Um, so yeah, apparently he uh, he was not happy with how this came out, and tried to uh, tried to be uh, tried to have his credit revoked. I mean, I see what he's saying, mm-hmm. and I don't know that I would say that any of these characterizations were the most uh, nuanced. No. No, they were very much, uh, like, everyone was pretty much out of central casting. It was like a Gilligan's Island group of, like, here's here's the rough and tumble sailor, here's, uh, you know, the the here's the rich guy, here's the plain woman, here's the richer woman. <laughs> the plain know. woman who at one point said, I grew up in the wheat fields. Yeah, because of course she did. Um, yeah, so that, so that all happens. You've got all these characters on the boat, and then... Uh, what happens? They drag another guy onto the boat, and uh, they pull him on, and he says, "Danke schön." And it's not Wayne Newton. And it's not Wayne Newton. It's uh, it's as un Wayne Newton as you can get. It's actually Capitan Willie, played by Walter Slezak. But we don't know at the time that he's the Capitan. Right. We just know he's a, he's a German soldier. He starts speaking German, and uh, and of course, Tallulah Bankhead speaks German. So they're speaking yeah. in German for a while. And at one point, I had we stopped the movie so I could go to the bathroom, and I came back and I said, "Is Tallulah a double agent?" <laughs> No. No, she isn't. She no. just happens to know German. Yeah. She, she's, a, she's a reporter. She's a woman of the world. Um, and that, that there are other implications uh, there, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, she knows German, so she ends up translating for this guy who says, no, he's just a crewman, not, a, not an officer. Um, he's sorry about what happened to your ship and blah, blah, blah. And so they... They take him on, and they have internal conflicts over should we trust this? Uh, should we trust this Nazi? And uh, again, this was made during the war, 1944. So it was very much um, it, it was it was very much a, a contemporary thing of like, yeah, no, he is a Nazi. And it was also very interesting to me because there's, you know, they said we'll keep him on the boat, we'll convert him to our way of thinking, and I wrote down how are you going to convert him to your way of thinking if you can't speak to him. <laughs> Like, what were they going to do? Are they going to get in his face and yell things like, you know, f- apple pie and baseball in his face in, like, special English? Mm-hmm. Was that the plan? Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly how all of this works. <laughs> um, going back to the plot from Wikipedia. Sorry. Uh, no worries. Uh, Willie is pulled aboard and denies being the U-boat's captain. During an animated debate, engine room crewman Kovac demands the German be thrown out to drown. However, the others object with radio man Stanley, a uh, wealthy industrialist Rittenhouse, and columnist Court Connie Porter, who speaks German, succeeding in arguing that he be allowed to stay. Porter, initially alone in the boat, had managed to bring her luggage with her, and her primary concern at first is a run in her stocking, because of course it is. Um, she's thrilled at having filmed the battle, but her movie camera is the first in a series of possessions to be lost overboard in a succession of incidents. Um, some of this plot section is written out of uh, order, but it, it gets the gist across. Um, there's Mrs. Higley. Her child is dead. Uh, um, Alice uh, is kind of going uh, bananas, as, as you might understand. Um, she's, she's going a bit delirious. She's traumatized. Um, they end up having to tie her down to stop her from hurting herself. Um, she, uh, she ends up, like, she tries to jump off the boat to follow her baby, because of course that when they gave the baby a, a burial at sea, she was uh, she was asleep, and they you know buried the baby at sea. So, armed with this knowledge, she she tries to leap off the boat, and everyone holds her back. They end up tying her to a chair, and uh, then everyone goes to sleep. And in the night, um, including the guy who was supposed to be on watch, um, who was Rittenhouse, um, the uh, during the night she succeeds in uh, going over the side of the boat. Um, which, uh, in the morning they find the rope leading from the chair off the boat and they pull it and there's weight on it and they realize what that means and cut the rope. So we're now down to seven people on the boat? We're, we're now down to, uh, eight, I think. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got Connie, Gus, uh, the Nazi, Alice, Kovac, Rittenhouse, uh, Sparks, and Joe. Right. So they're they're the ones they're the ones still on the boat. Yes. Um, but they've lost the grieving mother. Um, and the baby. And the baby. And at the, around this point, uh, Willie is revealed to be the captain, um, which they um, Tallulah kind of figures out, and then uh, says, "Well, his head's turned the other way, Herr Capitan," and she and he turns his head around, and it's like, "Yeah, he's the captain." Um, so I'm the captain. Now. Yeah, I think this is uh, after the amputation. 
or no, before the amputation. Before the amputation. Yeah. Um, because they know he's the captain when he, when he does the surgery. Right. Yes. Uh, at that, at this point it's, uh, the, the plot summary here doesn't go into it, but, uh, Gus who, uh, whose leg has been injured, um, it ends up being gangrene and, um, the Nazi like speaking German describes like the leg, the leg will have to come off and he was a surgeon in civilian life and could do the operation. And Gus doesn't want the surgery because he loves to dance and he's convinced his girlfriend is going to leave him if he has one leg. Mm -hmm. So there's this fascinating scene where Tallulah is trying to convince Gus to have the surgery because she's basically guilt tripping him into saying, you won't even trust this woman enough to see if she would take you, if she would still love you with one leg. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, man? What do you mean? Yeah. (laughs) And she she has to she has to talk him into wanting to remain alive so that he could go back to his girlfriend with one leg. So there's obviously no anesthetic on the boat. No, but she's got a big hunkin' bottle of brandy, which uh, they end up giving to Gus so he can uh, start drinking. And within like three gulps, he's trashed. Um, That's which, really not how that works. Yeah, I had to I had to confirm this with you. Um, yes. As as uh, as a uh, someone who's always been teetotal, I. I'm like, does is that accurate? Does that is that how brandy works? No, uh, that's I said that's not how anything works, <laughs> except maybe for rubbing alcohol. Yeah, and so so it uh, yeah it seemed to stretch, but uh, then then he ends up uh, he ends up getting drunk, uh, having an argument with Kovac over uh, who knows his girlfriend Rosie over what kind of a girl she is, and uh, this starts this theme in the movie, which is it's like of course of course this is going to be the case because it's a Hitchcock film, but it has a strange relationship with women. Um, and how it depicts them. And even this character of Rosie, who, who you never see, um, is, she's just talked about, they have this big thing over whether or not she's uh, that kind of a, that kind of a <laughs> dot, 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 and it's never... Uh, and they, that, she's not that kind of a, what do you mean she's that kind of a... <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Tallulah's like, well, some of my best friends are that kind of a... She says that all the, through the entire movie. That's like her catchphrase. It some is. of my best friends. Yeah, some, some of my best, best friends. friends. Some of my best friends are this, that... Some um, of my best friends are in the Navy. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it, it ends up being this whole thing. But uh, they, they have to trust the German because no one else that uh, Alice the nurse is like, I've never even assisted in a surgery. And so or they an have amputation. to... Or an amputation. Yeah, she says an amputation. She might have assisted in other surgeries. Right. Um, but uh, so they, they, have to trust, uh, they have to trust the Nazi to, uh, to cut this fella's leg off. So they do. And they do it in this way where... Like, it's very obviously, like, in the 1940s, they filmed this sort of thing far differently than they would today. Yeah. I mean, today you'd be seeing, like, really gory uh, cutting viscera. and There'd viscera. There'd be viscera everywhere. Blood squirting every which way. The guy would be screaming his head off. Um, but instead, it's all, like, very quietly done. Um, like, you have Gus getting drunk and kind of worriedly watching them uh, sterilize a, a pocket knife with a, with a lighter and, uh, you know, get bandages together and whatnot. And then, just trash. and then he passes just passes out. He he just passes out and stays passed out um, kindly enough where everybody can gather around him and do the surgery. Um, meanwhile, uh, Hume Cronin is uh, at the is at the rudder, and, and they're like, "Keep the boat steady." Yeah, they're like, "Keep the boat steady," and uh, just about this time, the water gets rough, and he has to he has to um, do what he can to keep the boat as as still as possible. And uh, that's totally how that works. Yeah, and so this this operation apparently is a success. And the indication that we're given about this is that uh, someone just uh, takes his uh, takes his right shoe and uh, throws it off into the middle of the boat because he won't be needing that anymore. And it's also kind of Chekhov's shoe. Yeah. Um, because it gets used later for another purpose. For another purpose. But um, so and and yeah, everything goes very quietly. And the next uh, the next fade in, you've got like, oh, you know, I, I feel OK. Are we in Bermuda yet? Because they think they're going to Bermuda. Um, oh, and the compass on the ship yes. is destroyed. Yeah, the compass on the lifeboat is destroyed, and they're trying to kind of go by the sun, but the sun's too high in the sky. They can't figure out which way is south-southeast that they should be going. And uh, then the Nazi says, uh, well, oh, it's this way. And um, someone else says, oh, it's it's this other way. And they end up having to trust the Nazi because reasons. Like, he he, he gives a very... Um, apparently convincing spiel about how he he knew which direction uh, everything was when when he 
when he uh, when his ship was blown up and he knows he knows the right way to Bermuda. So they 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 talk it amongst themselves. They're like, can we trust this guy? He's a Nazi. And they end up going, let's trust this. Let's trust this Nazi. So they so they let him set the course. Which, of course, goes great. Yeah, it goes it goes wonderful. Uh, back to the uh, back to the uh, plot summary here. The uh, the film follows the lifeboat inhabitants as they attempt to organize their rations, set a course for Bermuda, and coexist as they try to survive. The characters start out being good natured, cooperative, and optimistic about rescue. However, they descend into desperation, dehydration, and frustration with each other. The backstories of the characters are examined, and divisions of race, religion, sex, class, and nationality are brought to the surface. It's the Breakfast Club. It's totally the Breakfast Club. I didn't realize this until you until you mentioned it. Um, the passengers always cooperate th- through the stress, such as when they must amputate the leg of one of their boatmates, the German-American-born Gus Smith, um, played by William Bendix, because of gangrene. And that, that was another plot point. Uh, Smith did not trust the Nazi at all. He was very angry. His name, uh, the name he was born with was Schmidt, and he had to change it to Smith during the war. And uh, he's like, you made me hate my own name I was, bro- I was born with, and um, so on. So he's very, he's very uh, um, anti-Nazi. Anti-Nazi. Anti-German, really. Anti-German. Um, and anti this particular Nazi, but ends up having his life saved by him. Um, Kovac takes charge. Um, Rittenhouse had been like, oh, I'll, you know, he starts assigning work and uh, saying, you're, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of that, and like put, setting himself up as the skipper. Um, and then they're all like, wait, who, who voted you in charge? And some people are kind of okay with it, some aren't. And then Kovac is like, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a damn sailor. I'm, you know, I know how to get things done and what we need to do. And uh, I, he takes charge. I keep nodding when you're talking. <laughs> it's very good for audio. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, but uh, you know, he he takes charge, uh, and then they find out they come to find out that uh, oh, through through a heartfelt talk um, that Alice has with Tallulah over why she was going to uh, to England um, was to see a guy that was married but not to her. Yes. Um, and she's very like uh, like you know. She's the plain one. She's uh, Miss Middle America, um, who grew up in the wheat fields. In the wheat fields, and sometimes you could see the wheat fields when the wind blew. The wind, the wheat looked like the sea. Yeah, and uh, she. So she's the very she's the very girl next door who uh, is really conflicted because she's going out there to uh, see another woman's husband. See another woman's husband, and she's a fine woman, yeah. and they've got two beautiful children. Yeah, and Tallulah's like okay with it. She's like, oh yeah, she's Tallulah. I mean, she's what's Tallulah. she gonna say? She shows off this uh, sparkly diamond bracelet, and she's like, um, it came from my husband, my first husband. And, uh, you know, they, they go through this whole thing, and Tallulah ends up being, like, kind of tired of hearing about it, so she just feigns sleep, but keeps listening while Alice goes up to... Um, talk to Hume Cronin. To talk to Hume Cronin, um, who is, uh, who is at, the, at the rudder. And so she's talking to him about uh, about this this guy, and he's he's talking to her about it. And this eventually leads him to realize um, they start talking about someone else they knew on the ship who was, I guess, some sort of navigator, and uh, how he was navigating by the planet Mars. And uh, Hume like peers into the distance. This is this is at night, and he peers into the distance and goes, "That's the planet Mars. Wait, but that's the planet Venus. That means we've been going east, um, following the Germans' instructions. They've been going the wrong way." And it's also revealed um, at multiple times in the movie that the the German is looking at a little pocket watch uh, style compass that he keeps hidden in his pocket. So he's he knows where they're going. He it turns out is directing them to a, where he knows is a German supply ship. So uh, they could all be taken over by they could all be taken uh, prisoner by his side. Um, so they, at one point they said, do, "Do we know he's taking us to Bermuda?" And he said be a translation by Tallulah, he'd much rather be a prisoner in Bermuda than on this boat. At least in Bermuda, he'd have a bed and food. Yeah. So uh, so he convinced them of his intentions, but all the while he's been lying. Hume Cronin realizes uh, they've been going the wrong way. He's like, well, we'll see about that. And then cut to um, the next morning when everyone's sort of the, the, the Nazi's still asleep. Everyone else is sort of uh, huddled in conference and talking about like, well, maybe he didn't know we're going the wrong way, this and that. And they realize that uh, he had asked Tallulah the time, but uh, they saw he had a pocket watch. So uh, this is when um, Joe's uh, good old fashioned pickpocketing ability comes to comes into play, because they they have him after talking him into it because he he made a pledge to never uh, do that kind of thing again. And it's not fair to bring up something that somebody used to do and swore off. Yeah, um, uh, but they're like, no, you got You got to do it, and that's an order. And so he takes the order. 
he uh, he stumbles and bumps into the sleeping German, goes, pardon me, and comes up with his pocket watch, opens it. It's a compass. So they know he's been lying. Um, but uh, it turns out that although they know he's been lying, it turns out that uh, they've been off course for so long that it would take them far too long to actually get to Bermuda, and they're kind of stuck going where he wanted, which is the German supply ship. And, uh, and then... And then... The storm. Yeah. The storm happens... They they lose their food. They lose their they lose their water. Um, At one point, they tie Gus to the mast yeah. because they don't know where else to put him. Yeah, he can't he can't uh, hang on under his own uh, steam. Uh, he he goes uh, he goes overboard at one point, and they get him back um, because the storm is just like you know playing catch. It's like we'll take a guy off the boat, we'll throw him back onto the boat. Um, what are the chances? But okay, there's water everywhere. There's water everywhere. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. the Nazi starts shouting instructions. Yeah. In English. In English. You know, you, you get this, you tie that down, you know. And then, uh, you know, Tallulah is, of course, like, how, you know, why, why haven't you been speaking English? And he goes, I didn't know if I could trust you all. But uh, they basically, after the storm, they're, they're all pretty whipped. Um, and the German is now in charge because they have no other choice. They can't get anywhere else. There's no time. So he is hale and hearty. And rowing the boat because yeah. the mast broke in the sh- in the storm. Yeah, they they improvised a sail. Uh, they put a sail together before, but the storm destroyed that, so they can't control the boat. Um, but uh, then Capitan Willie um, is is rowing, and he's singing "Do Do Leakst Mir Im Herzen," <laughs> which yeah, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that song, and. Uh, <laughs> Sorry if I peaked, but um, no, that's like a legit mm-hmm. German song. And in fact, in my favorite Garrison Keillor book, there's a chapter, like a, a monologue that's called Du Du Leakst Mir Im Herzen. Um, <laughs> and Rit is playing on the flute while Willie is rowing and singing. Yeah. And he is in awfully good shape yeah. for being on this boat with no food or water. Yeah, and everyone else is all uh, tired and hungry and uh, thirsty. Crusty. Crusty. And uh, they're like, how, you know, a couple of guys offer to take over rowing, and he goes, no, he's, no, I got it. I can, I can do it. And it, it's, it's obvious he's not trusting any of them, but also he's not tired. He can, uh, he can just keep going somehow, and he just attributes it to right living. And they're all like, oh, they're supposed to be the Superman, you know, the, super, the master race. And may, maybe I'm starting to believe it. Gus had uh, been drinking seawater. Um, out of a mug that just that just he'd been dipping over the side. And there were a couple times when Alice had actually come and hit the mug out of his hands. Yeah. She said, "The salt's just going to make you thirstier. You might as well be drinking poison." Yeah, but uh, he just he decides, well, maybe I'm just going to drink poison and die because he's delirious coming back from his surgery, um, and now he's delirious because he's been drinking seawater and he's got one leg and he's got one leg, and uh, he didn't have all that much of a grip to begin with. Um, he's got you know it's really raining shit on this poor guy. Um, but, uh, while everyone else is, uh, is asleep, he, he comes awake and sees that, uh, while Willie is rowing, he's also sipping water from a flask in his shirt. And, uh, he's, The bourbon, excuse me, the brandy flask. Yeah, the brandy flask. From earlier. From earlier that, uh, that he had drunk all the brandy out of. So he, he tries to, he tries to nudge, uh, Hume Cronin and be like, you know, Willie's got water and... He, but at the same time, he was deliriously thinking he had a big glass of ice water and he was drinking it with Rosie. So, so uh, Stanley doesn't really yeah. listen. Stanley's like, yeah, sure, 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 Gus. Uh, you know, sure he does, and rolls over and goes back to sleep. But uh, so Gus kind of hobbles up to Willie and he's like, you know, why didn't you share that water with us? Willie keeps talking to him and he's kind of on another planet talking about, I'm going to see Rosie. I'm going to see Rosie and. Uh, the Nazi is like, yeah, sure, she's right out there waiting for you. Can't you see any points? And but first he says, remember that your name is Schmidt. It's yes. not Smith. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, completely German at you. Um, and then he says, look, there's Rosie. She's yeah. right there. Don't you see her? Mm-hmm. And so Gus, you know, literally turns around, and the Nazi pushes him over the side. So, so he's yelling, Stanley, Stanley, and mm-hmm. Stanley. Yeah. Stanley Stanley is asleep. It was like sort of like you should excuse me. Mm-hmm. One summer when I was a camp counselor, mm-hmm. I was and, and you pushed a kid off the side of a boat no, and let him die. No. No. Oh. First of all, I had girl campers, but I was sound asleep, and a child came in, came over to my bed and said, "Gila, Gila," and I said, "I'm sleeping," and she said, "Gila," and I said, 
I'm sleeping. And she came back a couple minutes later. This poor child had wet her bed, didn't know what to do, and I wasn't waking up. <laughs> it was not a good situation. Well, sometimes you can be kind of difficult to wake up. That's what I've heard. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but it's okay. Still love you. I love you, and I never pushed a kid off a boat. Well, you're young yet. There's still time. <laughs> Just to get us back to. <laughs> to get us back to where we were. To get us back to where we were. Um, so uh, going past that in the plot summary here, uh, Gus is coaxed overboard by Willie and drowns. Upon waking, the others discover Gus missing, and Willie is questioned. And uh, he's just like, oh, he went over. There was nothing I could do. It was terrible for me to watch. Meantime, they notice that uh, Willie is sweating with the exertion and none of them are sweating. Um, and Alice says, yes. like, I was I was going to I was trying to cry, but there are no tears because, of course, they're not. You know, everyone's dehydrated. So they realize he's got water and uh, they 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 get the they get the flask out of his uh, jacket. And and they and he's like, well, I I. You know, I filled it from uh, one of the ballast tanks uh, before the storm. It was foresight. And uh, I also had the food, uh, food pills and energy pills. And uh, because we all, we, all, we all prepare for these sort of things, and you got to be prepared. You should be thankful to yeah. me for planning ahead. Exactly. You should be thankful for me planning ahead. And uh, they, they basically, a, a number of the group, flip out um, and drag him over to the side of the ship. Um, someone picks up Gus's discarded shoe, and uh, they, they beat the hell out of him and toss him over the side. And uh, kill him. Now, did they toss him over the side and continue beating the hell out of him? Yeah, they. I think. I think. Uh, and of course, because this is a 1940s movie, you don't see any direct violence, but uh, you you see the backs of everyone as they they hurl him over the side. And I think the implication is he's still hanging onto the boat, and they they take the shoe and uh, you know knock him over the head or on the hands or and and or just basically yeah. anything they can pick up to hit him mm-hmm. with. Yeah, and uh, a bunch of them are a bunch of them are hitting him and attacking him, uh, even to Lula, but, uh, but not Joe. Um, not Joe because he's renounced that kind of life. He, he's not, he's not about that life. He's not about that life. And, uh, was there anyone else who wasn't, or did they all? They, they did. They, they it, all did. It, it was everyone but it was Joe. everyone but Joe. So all the white folks, uh, killed the Nazi <laughs> and, and then immediately they, they, they're like, they're ready to give up. And, uh, a lot of them are, kind of miserable because like oh we were a mob and uh and my last regret is that i joined a mob yeah that was uh that was written house yeah. yeah said that and uh Tulu was like we we weren't a mob when we killed him we were a mob when we just uh when we let him be when, in charge when we let him be in charge and just laughed with him and went along with uh, what he was doing to us and decided to be his prisoners um and then people really start uh feeling their neck they start really freaking out um Tulula starts uh Start screaming at uh, at this person and that person, blaming them all for uh, losing the rations and losing the water and this and that. Um, she she flips out. She goes full angry to Lula, <laughs> which uh, which is a sight. Yes. Um. And uh, then they 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 argue amongst each other. They some of them are starting to resign to their fate of just oh we're going to die out here. This is it. And then what happens? Uh, they're talking about. Uh, Oh yeah, there, there's a line here in the summary where um, Rittenhouse strikes uh, Willie over the head multiple times uh, with Gus's boot to prevent him from reboarding, and utterly disillusioned by Willie's behavior, laments, "What do you do with people like that?" And that's that's the line. That's the big, uh, the big. What do you do with people like that? He's like, you know, we 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 saved his life. We shared what we had with him, and uh, he he thanked us by uh, by lying to us and and uh, taking us all to a concentration camp. They're all talking about the concentration camps. They start talking about Tallulah's bracelet, and uh, she's got this, you know, blingy diamond bracelet, and it turns out they can use that to catch fish, because they've been having no luck catching fish, because they have no bait, but uh, then they realize, uh, then Tallulah offers the bracelet, and she's like, it's, you know, bait by Cartier. And, and it's also the only thing she has left. Yeah. Right? Her fur coat is gone. Mm-hmm. Her Mrs. fur coat is gone. Mrs. Higley was wearing it when she jumped. Right. Um, she she had her camera in the beginning, which uh, she lost. She had a typewriter, which was, she was like, okay, now I'm writing my book, and her that went overboard. Her typewriter was swept overboard. Um, so it was basically her last thing, but, uh, they, they tie it to a line. They, they throw it overboard. You see some, you know, interesting underwater camera work where they show this thing going down on a, on a string and then an actual fish coming up and, uh, biting on it. Um, 
So they, they start pulling this fish aboard and they start getting it up out of the water. And then uh, Joe is like, oh, look, it's a ship. And so they all turn around in surprise. They drop the line with the, br- with the, with the fish and the bracelet on it. And to lose my bracelet. And she just like loses it and starts laughing uncontrollably. Yes. Um, the, but uh, they look at the ship and realize, oh, it's the German supply ship. And they're like, well, I, I guess Willie won after all. And uh, they, they get ready to uh, they get ready to be. Uh, they taken consign to the themselves Germans. to their fate. They consign themselves to their fate. Um, a German lifeboat comes off the ship and starts rowing out to them. And uh, then. Then it turns around. Yeah, it turns the, the lifeboat turns around. The German um, lifeboat. Yeah, the German the German ship. Uh, you you see a light blinking on it, and they're like, "It's signaling." But why? And the lifeboat turns around, and they're like, "How can how can they be leaving us? That's inhuman. It's against uh, the the Geneva Convention and this and that." Um, was it the Geneva Convention in nineteen? I think they just said international law. Yeah, international law. Um, and uh, the then then they start hearing booms, and it's not a storm. In fact, the German ship is being fired upon. And so then, then they then they see that whole thing happening. The the Germans are being attacked by um, by an Allied ship, and the the lifeboat is um, basically caught up in in the in the uh, crossfire. Like they've they've got uh, they've got shots exploding in the water around them. Um, the German ship trying to get away from the firing like goes right up next to their ship, um, next to their lifeboat. Um, and they then basically the Germans, uh, get sunk. Their boat gets exploded. Um, bits of it are, are falling, uh, out at the lifeboat people, which, uh, watching that scene, I'm just like, you see, you see an, uh, a, a face on shot of everyone in the lifeboat as like all this debris is coming out toward them. And I'm like, you know, who, who did they fight over? Who got to be the stagehands that threw bits of, uh, <laughs> you know, bits of lumber and stuff at Tallulah Bankhead and Tim Cronin. These are excellent questions. Um, but uh, but they're they're just in awe of this uh, site, and then uh, they they realize oh the Amer- the American ship will be here in uh, twenty minutes or the Allied ship whatever the Allied ship is the, coming in about twenty minutes yeah the good guys and will they're be like here in oh wait minutes. we have twenty minutes left together yeah so then they start like showing pictures of their family yeah and oh Alice and Stanley are like engaged yeah Alice and Stanley uh, had a had a thing and. Uh, when when they when they think they're going to die, uh, Stanley was like, you know, if, you know, after we got out, uh, after we got out of this, I was going to ask you to marry me, you know, this woman that he just uh, kind of, who then says, and she was like, oh, I don't even know your last name. Yeah, and his last name is Garrett, with two R's and two T's. And she's like Garrett. Yeah, and she's, Garrett, she's which I think was her way of saying, yeah, let's get married. Yeah, and so so everyone's kind of like, oh, okay, we're we're not dead. Uh, the good guys are coming, and uh, then another pair of hands. Uh, grip the edge of the lifeboat. They bring another guy online. Uh, online. On, they bring another guy on board, and uh, he says "Danke, Shane." And you know, immediately, uh, Kovac and a couple other people are just like, you know, throw him back, throw him back. And then, he but this up. guy, this guy is a kid. Um, he's he's a younger kid and a younger a young man, and he's injured. And they're like, you know, we we can't. He's injured. He's hurt. Uh, you know, and then. As, the, as they're arguing over, like, are we going to help this Nazi now? Then he pulls out the smallest gun yeah. known to mankind. Yeah, the kid, the kid pulls out a tiny, a tiny gun and weakly uh, points it at the crowd. And, uh, of course, it's Joe that comes up and, uh, and knocks it out of his hand, and they throw it overboard rather than point it back at him, which uh, I thought was significant. Um, he says something in German, and Tallulah translates it. Yeah. Aren't you going to kill me? Yeah, to which uh, they're like, what do you do with people like that? Um, aren't you going to kill me? And yeah, you know, that's that's kind of that's kind of where it fades. You don't see them get uh, rescued or anything. They're just uh, like, you know, they're they're obviously going to get saved, and they've not killed this second Nazi. Um, so that's uh, that's where that's where it's left. And um, Hume Cronin and uh, Alice are going to get married, and everyone's talking about uh, you know talking jovially, and that's that's the end of that. That's the end of that. And that's and that's lifeboat. Um, the the uh, so the movie was, you know, I, I first saw this on television as a kid, mm-hmm. um, and I was way too young to understand like the greater uh, World War II stuff. But uh, I had seen enough war movies to know like uh, okay, you know, there's the good guys, there's the bad guys, um, and there's what was going on. Um, I saw it a couple of uh, more times over the course of my life. I haven't seen it in a long time, um, and I had I, never seen it. Yeah, but I, I had the I had the DVD kicking around. And so, uh, yeah, um, talking, talking about the movie in general, I mean, you said it didn't set your world on fire. It did not. And part of it is because I think it's like that 
you know, that capsule concept where they're just all in one space. Yeah. And visually it was not exciting because they're all in one place, Mm -hmm. you know, and at least like in the breakfast club, which to me is the ne plus ultra of a capsule movie in that way. Yeah. You know, like there was never a part where Ali Sheedy was making her pixie sticks and Captain Crunch sandwich. Yeah, they, they never they never put on a record and did any like rail dances on the edge of the bow. And they never smoked weed. I mean Yeah. They didn't smoke weed, which somehow made them better friends. And they didn't crawl through the air shaft and tell a bad joke. I mean, there's just so many things that didn't happen. No no one sexually assaulted anyone under a table, which was seen as cute. Um, also true. We could talk about the Breakfast Club another time. Could you describe the ruckus? <laughs> yes. Um and uh, there's in the very beginning where you're just seeing different rooms in the school, there's the computer room and a sign on the wall saying hackers will be expelled. Um, we can definitely. That's talk. in the breakfast club. We, not we, life, but, we can but, talk about the breakfast club. But yeah, that another that's, that's for another time. That's definitely for another time. But, uh, but yeah, by and large, like I, I talk a little about how how this movie treats women. Um, and, you know, you had this off screen woman who was that kind of a. Um, you had the, the, you had Tallulah who was basically seen as like the, you know, standing up for herself, uh, self-sufficient, uh, you know, upper class, uh, lady, although it's, it's later revealed that she grew up in the crappy end of Chicago, right along with Kovac. She just, uh, got herself out of it and, um, talks about the bracelet being like what opened the doors for her and stuff. But, uh, so she's, she's someone who obviously like, I guess in, Again, in the parlance of the times, she she might have compromised herself to get where she wanted. Um, but uh, you you had uh, Alice, who was the you know probably the 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 most positive depiction of a woman in the whole movie, yeah, and she was going fair. off to stop a guy who was married. Um, she and but she's conflicted about it. So well, that's and, something. And and she ends up uh, finding finding love with uh, with Hume Cronin, which really you know who wouldn't right? But um. But yeah, basically, that's that's the role of women is to either be off screen motivations for things and still be talked about as as that kind of a, or be uh, punished for when they want to assert themselves, or or uh, like I think that was that was very significant with Tallulah losing all her uh, fancy things, um, you know every everything she did to get that stuff and get where she wanted and it just all went overboard at various times um, until she ended up cracking up about it. Um, and then, and then Alice, uh, she's, she's redeemed basically when she, when she ends up, uh, doing the right thing and finding herself a nice single man instead of, uh, her, her European, uh, affair dude. So yeah, that's women for you. Huh? But I mean, that's Hitchcock and women. Yeah. I mean, Hitchcock and women is a whole, like there are theses written on this, I'm sure. Yeah. And I'm not going to write another, but, uh, and at the time, and I found I found this stuff interesting from the Wikipedia article. Uh, they're talking about at the time it was this movie was criticized for being too generous a depiction of the Nazi, hmm. like being too sympathetic to him. Yeah. Um, and uh, people and and Hitchcock like and Tallulah Bankhead afterward were talking about no the 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 idea is that you know even though he seemed friendly and everything you you end up you can't trust the Nazi. And. You know, again, the the German they get at the end is uh, basically when the Americans are coming up, or or, or the Allies, whoever, are are coming up, and they know they're basically taking him to go be a prisoner of war. Um, but uh, but and it was it was seen for a while as uh, one of Hitchcock's lesser films, although these days it seems to be uh, it seems to be a little more well received among film dorks. Yeah. And maybe, again, it's just, oh, look, it's a World War II movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know. For, for the listeners, she just did a triumphant little uh, fist bump punch <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when I was in high school, a friend of mine and I got in trouble for not paying attention. We were in AP European history. It was my senior year. And our teacher was talking about World War II and the Holocaust. And my friend and I were just like kind of checked out of what he was saying. And he asked us to stay after class. And he was like, why weren't you paying attention? And I said to him, (laughs) I appreciate what you're trying to tell us. We've been getting this in both ears since we were five. Literally ask me anything. Good point. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah, uh, because you had gone to you had gone to Jewish schools earlier. And, it, uh, I mean, I went to Jewish schools, yeah, but also just like when I was in eighth grade, we had mm-hmm. a Hebrew school class that was called Holocaust. Not even the Holocaust, just <laughs> Holocaust. <laughs> Did, did they did they talk about it like the British uh, in hospital, you know when when we were in Holocaust, it was like oh hey it's Thursday it's time to go to Holocaust, yeah. and <laughs> yeah and in Holocaust <laughs> at the... it's time to go to Holocaust yeah it's about to get better though because when we started Holocaust we were each issued a little yellow felt star that we had to wear in class. Oh, good grief. And if you didn't wear the little yellow star in class, you got in trouble. Wow. And wait. And if you... W- the principal of the Hebrew school mm-hmm. would occasionally come in to do a raid... He would come in with a super soaker and shoot you. And when he came in, wait, (laughs) when he came in for the raid, you had to stand on one foot. And if he saw you standing on two feet, he would shoot you with the super soaker. And if he saw that you weren't wearing your star, he would shoot you with the super soaker. And if he felt like it, he would shoot you with the super soaker. And everyone was okay with this? Not only was everyone okay with this, there were people, like, we had two nights of Hebrew school that year. Uh Monday night we had a class about, like, values, and I don't remember what all, and Thursday night was Holocaust. And there were kids who didn't come to the Monday night class, they only came to Holocaust. (laughs) We had three times as many kids in Holocaust as we did in Monday class. So Holocaust was popular. Holocaust was incredibly popular, (laughs) which, again, I realize is a weird thing to say, but, oh, my God, people loved Holocaust. Uh, 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 You know, we're a Creative Commons podcast, so people can take clips of this (laughs) and use them in all sorts of ways. Holocaust was a big hit at the United Tomatora of Omaha. (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. So... (laughs) On that note, <laughs> Holocaust. Holocaust. It's, a, it's, an, it's one of those words that just starts to lose meaning when you say it a lot. Is it, though? Well, maybe not. No. It's one of those words that starts, like, it's hard to say a lot. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's some words when, like, you write them down a lot and you lose a sense of what they are, like, fork. <laughs> Holocaust, no. <laughs> yeah. Can't really lose the thread on that one. <sighs> yeah. So, so this film was, uh, you know, heavily criticized at the time for being too nice to the German, and also criticized at the time for um, the stock black character, which uh, even like for the time to be criticized for having a stock uh, black character. I mean, that's in 1944. Pretty advanced already. I mean, you know. We were five years after Gone with the Wind. We were five years after Gone with the Wind. This guy wasn't uh, wasn't exactly Uncle Remus, but uh, he was, uh, you know, he was, I guess, positively portrayed, but uh, you know, still just very broad strokes. He wasn't Uncle Remus, but he wasn't Mister Tibbs. <laughs> that is true. How about that? Uh, that's. I think that's uh, that's a good note to end this on. Uh, Hitchcock had his uh, cameo in this film, as he did in all his uh, films. Um, but there are no passers-by walking in the background, walking a dog, like in his other films. Cause boat. Boat. So uh, one of the characters is reading a newspaper at one point, and you see an ad for a weight loss drug. And uh, Hitchcock is the model in the ad before and after. It was real special. Yeah. And uh, that's Lifeboat. I guess uh, any, any, any sort of uh, final conclusions, uh, thoughts about this movie? Um... So I'm sorry, who was the guy who was the, the mutual friend of Gus and Kovac who introduced Gus to Rosie? Oh, his, it, it was, he was an Armenian. Armenian. And he had some kind of long name. Right. And like, I kept, it wasn't Mr. Bob Dabalina, but it was close. It's Al something. Al, Al Bob Dabalina. Al Bob Dabalina. And he's an Armenian rug cutter. Yes. And it was like dancer or <laughs> carpet seller. 
Why not both? Why not both? So, all in all, about Lifeboat, like, for me, um, I think it's I think it's still a good movie, mm-hmm. as movies go. Um, I've always been kind of really interested in in the sort of capsule type of stories, where it's a very limited uh, set. Um, Hitchcock did a few of those. You know, Rear Window is basically in this one guy's apartment. Right. Um, Breakfast Club's another one, which uh, That's somehow... That's not a Hitchcock movie. It's not, it's not a Hitchcock movie, but it's an 80s movie that somehow, I think, managed to age more poorly than this 40s movie in some ways. Yeah. Um, but again, we'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think it's interesting as a, a media portrayal of... World War II while World War II was going on. That's very true. I think in its moment, of its moment, Mm -hmm. it's a very interesting way to look at it. It's also a World War II movie that's not all like uh, flying aces, you know, having dogfights or, or, you know, brave uh, brave soldiers going out and uh, and kicking ass and everyone, uh, you know... It's it's not one of these triumphant banner waving things. It's not a war movie. It's it's not about the war. It's about a bunch of like regular ass people who are caught up in it. Are caught up in it. But yeah, I I think this this movie is not a perfect movie. Um, Hitchcock did better, uh, but uh, but there have also been a lot worse movies made about the subject. And I like that it wasn't a big banner waving thing. Apart from the by war bonds thing at the end. Yeah. It was. Uh, but they may have had to like. Yeah. That might have had to have been there. <laughs> Yeah, it, I think I think it might have. sort of like an MPAA rating. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, the story holds up. Um, another thing I remember from my youth is that they remade this movie in the '90s um, as a sci-fi movie called Life Pod, where it was the uh, life pod off a spaceship, and it was uh, apparently directed by um, and and starred Ron Silver. And uh, so it was. It was kind of a hinky TV movie, which I vaguely remember seeing. I, I haven't gone back to gone back to look at that um, at any point, but uh, I, I vaguely remember like seeing seeing that uh, it was a remake of uh, of Lifeboat, very obviously, except with spaceships and aliens and whatnot. Hmm. So maybe that'll be worth going back to at some point. But Tallulah's not in it, so. Well, I mean, if there's no Tallulah, sh- hmm. Well, that was Lifeboat. That was Lifeboat. And uh, next time you get to spring a movie on me. Excellent. So we're going to have to do a couple of more Mm -hmm. because I don't want to wait so long, but there's one that I want to do at the beginning of June to tie it to Shavuot. (laughs) Okay. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. And I think uh, maybe next time we could do what we did this time where like you can spring it on me at the beginning of recording. Excellent. And, uh, and we'll go from there. Wonderful. This um, was fun. This this is fun, and uh, not bad for a first film podcast ever. Absolutely. Um, I guess uh, I will. I will just. Uh, I will just say, thank you for watching this with me. Thank you for watching this with me. Thank you for sharing it with me. And thank you out there for listening to Modern Technology Watches. Hey, I have an idea. Mm-hmm. Dinner. Dinner. I have one other idea. What other idea? Okay, turn around because I need you to look at what I've been looking at. It is so lopsided over there. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm going to leave this bit in the podcast, and I'm not even going to tell anyone what you're referring to. That's fantastic. <laughs> I think this out of context would be kind of perfect. Fantastic. And just for the record, mm-hmm. Holocaust was huge at the United Tomatory of Omaha. <laughs> Very popular. <laughs> <laughs> I could have sworn I told you about that. You did not. Okay. So, uh, yeah, he would show up and go raid, <laughs> walk around with a super soaker. I'll, uh, I'll record some end credits, uh, later, but, uh, right now this is Rob Vincent and Gila Drazen and, uh, we'll catch you next time. See you at the movies. You've been listening to episode one of Modern Technology Watches with Rob Vincent and Gila Drazen. Go to modern.technology on the web for more info on this program, the people involved, episodic show notes, our other podcasts, and our social media shrapnel. Our theme music is The Promise by Torley Wong, released Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0. More info at modern.technology slash music. Find more from Torley at T-O-R-L-E-Y dot com. Thank you, Torley. Content from Wikipedia is used under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0, produced by Modern.Technology. Send us email at watches at modern.technology.
And that's all you see at the end is Tallulah just with her fist up in the air. 